I really want to thank Melody and, and Matthew for what they, they just did on this stage. The, the vulnerability and the rawness that they left out here. I mean, they really just paid the path for what I'm going to continue doing tonight. And I want to talk more about our Redeemer. But before I do that, there's a topic that keeps resurfacing in my life I want to talk about really quickly. If that happened, someone keeps mentioning something or something keeps happening. So I want to talk about tattoos. So people keep spontaneously recently showing me their tattoos and sharing their stories. Um, I don't know if it's because my pastor just got a tattoo and now he thinks he's cool enough to have one. I don't know what it is, but there's a motif of tattoos in my, my life right now. And, and so I'm just curious, does is, is anybody here have a tattoo? All right, that's everybody. Everybody here has a tattoo, pretty much. Anybody here have a tattoo that they've had for less than one year? All right, got it recently. Anybody have a tattoo that they've had longer than five years? Signify by raising your hand. Longer than 10 years? Longer than 15 years? Would you get the same tattoo now that you got 15 years ago? Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. No. <laughs> See, I, I just know that I'm so inconsistent that, like, I don't have a tattoo. But if I did, the tattoo I got at age 15 would not be what I wanted at age 30. I always change my mind and my taste and flavors about things. And, and, and I know that legal age to get a tattoo is 18. But if you're in this group, there's a possibility you got one when you're 15. So I don't want, I don't want to hear it. All right? So I don't, I don't have an inked tattoo. But if, if I had tattooed on me all the insults, the labels, the words people have put on me in my life, I would be covered in tattoos. I would have sleeves of shame and, and label the fat, unattractive, loser, hopeless, outcast, rejected, would be all over my body. There would be no clean skin left if everything that people have said about me and thought about me had stuck and become inked on my skin. There'd be nothing left of me. And, and I think that would happen to all of us here. I don't think I'm special. I think we've all been through that. Where we've been shamed by others. And that my spirit got tattooed through people of this world. And, and as most of you know, I've, I've been sober for 21 years from alcohol and drugs. And that God, thank you for that. God, God saved me, and I, I found my salvation in, in a hospital bed, and, and I, I got it when I understood that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that I had overcome through him sin and death. I liked that idea. I liked the idea of being in heaven. I thought that was great. And so he redeemed me from alcohol. But I also, through my sobriety, I struggled with eating disorders and toxic relationships and instant gratification. And so I've had to learn to be redeemed from all of that, including just being redeemed from self. I am redeemed from self. And that's why it's recovering redemption. This has been a long process for me. When I started coming to this church, Mosaic, I had 10 years of sobriety. And about 11 years of sobriety, and I've been at Mosaic for probably about a year, I started dating this guy. And he had tattoos, he had real tattoos, and if he had had an accurate tattoo, it would have said, would you go out with me, become emotionally and spiritually bankrupt, lose almost everything you've worked for in your sobriety, um, circle yes or no. <laughs> and I, I circled yes. <laughs> I saw all the red flags, but I circled yes. And, um, and I... I said, here's my phone number, address, pick me up at night, 7 o'clock. And so the process started. It didn't matter that I was sober, and I was saved. I believe I've been saved through all this, but in that area, I wasn't living in my redemption. And so I spiraled deeply into old behavior of an eating disorder, and I stopped eating. And if I did eat, I binged and purged. And I, it didn't matter if I was a therapist, it didn't matter if I was successful, I plummeted. Two very significant things happened during that time I want to share with you. And actually, I don't want to share 
any of this with you. I don't want to talk about this at all. I don't want to be this vulnerable with you. But God has laid this on my heart with what Melody and Matt said. I have no choice but right now let the Holy Spirit speak through me. One thing that was significant that happened is that uh, I was going to Mosaic, but whenever there was a holiday or celebration, I would always go to Central Church of God, which is Matt's church. The music at Central Church of God is phenomenal. The, the preaching there is amazing. So it was Easter time, and I went to that church. And I met two friends there, and they're both in the medical community. And one's a doctor, and one's a nurse. And so I hadn't seen the nurse in a while. And so we met there, and, and she looked at me, and you know how nurses are so sweet and compassionate? No. So that's what I mean. She's very country. And she said, You look like you just got out of the Holocaust. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not minimizing the Holocaust at all. But for me, at that time, that was a compliment. I was that sick. See, for 10 years, people have come to me and said, I see life in you. You're an inspiration. I can get sober by watching you. And now I'm 11 years sober and people see death in me. And I went into that church and, and the reenactment they do of the resurrection and the music there is exceptional. And I stood there where everyone was praising and being a part of the Holy Spirit. And I felt nothing. See, I numbed myself because of the relationship with this man. I didn't want to feel what was happening to me. But I also, at the same time, numbed myself of God's love. It didn't mean it wasn't there, but I numbed myself and I stopped feeling. Soon after that, Mosaic asked me for the first time to speak at an event. It's a small event for just women. And I stood in front of my Christian sisters and I shared how God had redeemed me from alcoholism. I shared how he had taken me from the depth of despair and the depth I was facing and he had recovered me and redeemed me from taking a drink on a daily basis. And I meant every word I said and I loved the Lord and I, I spoke truth. But I left there and I went home and I binged and purged. And I was on my knees in front of the toilet at my house. And I need you to know every time near the end of my bulimia that I purged, I thought I was going to die because I was choking and I couldn't breathe, but I couldn't stop doing it. And I don't know why this day was different for me, but it was. And I was on my knees and I had shame all over me because I had just shared my story with my Christian sisters. And here I am facing destruction, feeling like I'm going to die. And I looked up, and again, I know he's always there, but this time, when I looked up on my knees, I saw his hand. The hand of grace was extended to me. So that's what grace is. Grace is God offering himself, offering his love to those who are unworthy. And he doesn't view me as unworthy. He knows that I feel unworthy. And he offers me his love. Not anyway, not in spite of me, but because of who he is and who I can be in him. And I still don't know why on that day I took his hand, but I did. And he picked me up off of rock bottom and stood me up and put me back on top of my salvation and being in my redemption because he is my redeemer. And I've never participated in that behavior since. I stepped back in to my redemption that day. Redemption means that I am redeemed from the bondage of self. Can you help me out, Adam? Redemption is freedom from the bondage of self. See, bondage is that cement. It's that attachment. And that attachment is shame. Shame is that lie. Shame tells me I have to earn my worth. I have to do enough to get the feeling of being worthy. I have to be there for you in some way. I have to hurt enough, clean up enough, be small enough, look a certain way. I have to earn 
who I am. That bondage attaches me to self. Self is of this world. Self-centered, self-seeking, self-fulfilling. Self attaches me and conforms me to the patterns of this world. And that redemption is me saying I will no longer believe that I have to earn my own worth, that I get to be free, and that I can be redeemed. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6.20, you are not your own. You are bought at a price. See, this, this Yeti has worth. It costs something. So what you think you're worth is your cost. His word tells me I'm priceless. I'm already paid for. I don't have to earn anything. When I woke up today, I am just as worthy this morning as I am that I spent all day helping people. My worth didn't change. I don't have to earn it anymore that I am not my own. It's not my life. When I am in self, I'm living my life as if it is mine. It is not mine. That the word redeemed has in it the word me. See, God's called me to be me. I get to have my personality. I get to have Christ inside of me. What I am redeemed from is the self, the one who thinks that she has to get your approval, the one who thinks she has to work so hard for you and that you get to dictate my day, that I have to be someone else. I'm already paid for. He's called me to be me. You know, when Christ was on the cross, and, and when you think about the Redeemer, the visual is that he's literally on the cross. That is a picture of your Redeemer. He's paying the price for you at that moment. The pain he went through was excruciating. You know that the word excruciating is taken from the word crucifixion. That's where it comes from. That he went through that much pain for us. It was excruciating. And that when I focus just on self, I forget what he went through. It's already been done for me. And I will vacillate in that. That's why it's a recovering process I can forget easily. So, I probably don't need to tell you all who this is. If anybody here have been in prison, I'll just to let you know this is Donald Trump. Uh, this is not a political conversation. He's up here for a reason. So Donald Trump professes to be a Christian. He will tell you that he doesn't need the Redeemer because he's never done anything wrong. He doesn't have to earn his worth that he is so worthy. That he doesn't have to ask for forgiveness. He does not need grace because he's never sinned in his life. That's his understanding of redemption. This is Catherine Carroll. Catherine was your 10-minute speaker last month. We talked about Rock Bottom, did an exceptional job. She stood up here and told you about her fighting for redemption, that she thought she had to go earn it herself, that because of the things she had done, the mistakes she had made, that she had to do more for her son, to look a certain way, keep her house clean, be the perfect wife. She had to redeem it herself. These two are the same. See, for him, he doesn't need the Redeemer because he's already perfect. For her, she has to earn it. You cannot earn your redemption. That's why it's so hard for so many people, especially people who struggle with codependency and people-pleasing. You can't earn it. You're already paid for so Catherine can't do enough to be redeemed. He can't be so perfect, he doesn't need a redeemer. There's a whole middle ground between these two people. And in that balance is struggle. Redemption means that you're in the struggle, but you don't believe you are the struggle. It means you know that you're going to hurt and you're going to hurt other people, but you won't believe that you are that hurt. It's in the middle that that is where the me is, that you're allowed to be human, you're allowed to hurt and hurt other people. You just don't have to believe that you are what you have done. Matt is not 
what he experienced. He is not a drug dealer. He is God's child. Melody is not what was done to her by her ex-husband. She's God's little girl. That is who she is. That we aren't here to earn our redemption. We're here to simply grab his hand and receive it. I want to show you what I mean. I'm going to ask my friend Justin, will you come up, please? So Justin's going to play Jesus, so pretty close. So he's going to stay here. And so this is my friend Rachel. She spoke for us last week. And so for those who struggle and you think you have to earn your worth, you have to go do something for people, make them a casserole, do certain things to make sure that you know that you have to seek out and be, seek your redemption. So if I reach down for her, it's a little bit hard. Pull her up, start to uh, jerk, jerk a little bit. She's got a lot better chance. She's going to pull me down so... <laughs> I get your point. She's going <laughs> to pull me down so much faster than I'm going to pull her up to where I am. But if I hang on to my Lord and Savior, and he is grace, he is love, and he is my stabilizer, and then I try to breach her, I can bring her down the place, but I'm simply the vessel. When I let go and I do it, I think I am God. I am being the emotional savior. That is not redemption. That we got to hang on. And I'm reaching for her because I know I'm worthy in him. I'm not reaching for her because I'm trying to prove my worth. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate it. There's a Scripture, I think we all know, John 19, 30, so powerful that on the cross, our Redeemer said, it is finished, and grace was born. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. See, that day that I was in the hospital bed in a detox center, that day I was on my knees in front of, of a toilet, that, those are the days that I said, it is Finish. And I accepted God's grace. That is the day that I bowed my head and I gave up what blocked me from his spirit. And I came back into his grace, into his love. If there's anything here that blocks you from knowing that you are worthy to be in his spirit, today's the day to let go of that. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 20 Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We don't care how many tattoos they have, how many scars, how many imperfections are there. That is not what matters in Christ. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside and see, and what we see is that anyone United with the Messiah, it's a fresh start. That Christ is in me. And then when there, that is united, I get a fresh start. I am not my label. I am not my mistake. I am redeemed in him. The Redeemer lives in me, and I get to be created new. And the old life is gone. All of this comes from God, who settled a relationship between us and him, then called us to settle our relationship with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, through our Redeemer, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins when I know that I am redeemed and I'm forgiven of my sins and I am able to go to you and represent my Redeemer, that he is in me and I'm able to put pride aside and sin aside and be with you, knowing that I can forgive you because I am forgiven. When I know that I'm hanging on to grace, I can give you grace. Because we're speaking for Christ himself now. We're in our recovery and redemption. When we know that we are redeemed in him, we are his vessel. We get to speak out for him. Because it's not about me. I'm not telling you tonight about Jesus, 
because I need something. I'm not seeking my worth from you. I already have that from him. And from that place, we can speak out for Christ. Become friends with God. He is already friends with you. See, God's always been my friend. He's always been there, even though I didn't know his name or what he was doing. Their friendships go so much better when they're a two-way street. He's already there for you. Please stop believing that you don't deserve his love. Please stop believing that you have to fight in order to get your worth. He's already right there. You know, if, if Christ had literally, when he, when he was crucified, took on the tattoos and all the labels, all the sins, all was put on us, I think this is what it would look like. That on him it was an outcast, an addict, and hopeless. It would be all over him. And this is what our Redeemer looked like. And then he went to the tomb. And just as he resurrected me that day in front of that toilet and helped me to rise up, that it all happened because the resurrection happened at the tomb. He came out clean. As I stand here today with no tattoos on me, that my skin is clean because it's washed in the blood of the Lamb, that I don't have to have a tattoo on me today. If I had a tattoo, I would pick Redeemed. This is the only one for me that I need. And that even in times when the shame comments try to come back, the labels try to come back on me, that this, this tattoo of redeemed is what covers up anything and everything in the world is going to try to tell me I am. So tonight, when you leave, if you, for some reason, would like to have a reminder of what Melody talked about, what Matt talked about, that we are redeemed. So we two people, Jesus was one of them, that will be standing at the door. <laughs> Jesus and Courtney, who's an angel, will be standing at the door. And if you want to have that, just expose your arm in some way or your hand, and they will stamp redeemed on you. So you can look down and see the truth that you are redeemed. Can I pray for you? All right, bow our heads. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for the courage that's in this room, the people who open their hearts and their ears. And there's people who have heard things tonight they weren't even ready to hear, but you know they're ready, Lord. That you are our Redeemer, and I thank you. I thank you that I don't have to have it all straight. I thank you that I don't have to know exactly what to do in every moment. I just need to remember I don't have to earn my worth because you called me priceless that the price has been paid, Lord, and help us to remember that in the most parts of our days. We go forth from here out, Lord. Help us to know that we are already redeemed. We have nothing to prove. There's nothing else to do, Lord, but to accept your grace and to grab your hand when we're down. I pray that people go through this month and remember all the messages they heard tonight, Lord, but bring them back next month, Lord, for they can continue to hear the miracles that you do in our lives and how amazing you are. So I just pray that every person here would just know that you are the God of all gods, the only Lord we're serving, and that we love you, Lord. Pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.